For our final lesson, this is lesson number three. We're talking about third-party reproduction now. This is specifically about egg donation, sperm donation, and gestational carriers. We'll also talk briefly about embryo donation. Okay. So there are a lot of indications for third-party reproduction. I'm going to talk about this from the standpoint of each third-party source, egg, sperm, and then uterus, basically, with the gestational carrier. So let's first start with sperm donation. Um, just what are some common indications for sperm donation? I think it's important to first think about that. So obviously, you know, someone has severe male factor infertility. So the husband maybe has Kleinfelters. Um, and makes no sperm in his ejaculate or his testicle. That would be an indication to use a sperm donor. Maybe the guy is uh, has a really rare, a translocated SRY onto the X. I mean, that's I've seen that once, so let's not go there. But basically, they have no sperm in their ejaculate for whatever reason. Another more common example would be someone who had chemotherapy at a young age or at a as a teenager or as a young uh, adolescent or as a young male, uh, young man, and um, it basically got sterilizing doses of chemotherapy for leukemia or lymphoma. Those would, that would be another common indication for using a sperm donor. Um, if you're in a same-sex female relationship, that would be an indication you need a sperm source, so we need a sperm donor. A uh, single female, maybe the patient is single, has not yet found the right partner, and just wants to become a mother. And then, of course, if you have a genetic disease, maybe you're with the male partner. Maybe the male partner has uh, a balanced translocation, and as a result, you keep having recurrent pregnancy loss. Uh, maybe they have a severe genetic disease, and testing for that against that disease is not practical for you for whatever reason, and you just want to use a sperm donor. Other indications might be severe male factor that has resulted in failed fertilization with IVF with ICSI, or just negative pregnancy outcome in general, and one option might be to use a sperm donor. So sperm donation can happen in one of two scenarios. You can either have known sperm donors or you can have anonymous sperm donors. I'm gonna talk about anonymous first, and then we'll talk about known. Anonymous is pretty common. There are multiple sperm banks across the country that recruit men through various channels to be sperm donors. One of the largest uh, centers, for example, one of the largest sperm banking centers, for example, ha has the following criteria. They have to, men have to be between ages of 21 and 39. They have to have a college degree. They self-report all their family history, their genetic history, their medical history. They do undergo genetic testing and counseling. So, for example, they would uh, be subjected to expanded carrier screening, uh, which Dr. Gray, you know, which we talked about previously with Dr. Gray and the um, genetic uh, diseases uh, lecture, um, they would be ex exposed to some expanded carrier panel that would look, screen for, you know, anywhere from 47 to 200 uh, known autosomal recessive rare mutations. They would also see a genetic counselor who would construct some family tree. They would undergo a physical exam um, to make sure they don't have any signs of any infection uh, or sexually transmitted infection. They would answer a questionnaire uh, this is a little hard to read, so let me clean that up a little bit. They would basically have to uh, answer a questionnaire, which screens for any high-risk behavior. So, hey, did you um, uh, live in Europe during the mad cow disease epidemic, and are, are you at risk for having prion disease? Um, hey, are you a, you know, are you, were you born in sub-Saharan Africa during the AIDS epidemic? So basically screening for high-risk um, behaviors or risk factors, basically, for infectious diseases. On the questionnaire is, are you a male who have sex who has sex with men as well? So again, there's a 35 questions. You could go to the FDA uh, website and look at what those questions are. And again, if you, you are subjected to those questions, and then you're subjected to the physical exam, and then you're subjected to um, STD testing. Um, so STD testing and questionnaire. Now, these elements are required by the FDA. So these are FDA, by law, any tissue donor, whether you're donating a kidney, a liver, um, or sperm, has to undergo a donor eligibility determination. So this is very important, donor eligibility determination. And the FDA comes and audits clinics and donor agencies 
to make sure they are following the rules. Because if you don't document these things, then you are subject to losing your, um, you could be fined and then given the scarlet letter saying you're not compliant and that's publicly available. Um, and no one wants that. Donor eligibility determination is what has to happen. And it should be noted that the STDs that are drawn are typically, uh, you know, HIV 1, 2, HTLV 1, 2, um, RPR, hepatitis B, surface antigen, hepatitis C virus, antibody, uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia. And those are sent to not just your routine lab core or retail lab or hospital lab. They have to be sent to a reference lab that uses very high uh, positive predictive value um, assays. So it has to be sent to a specific lab. So again, this is what has, the donor has to go through. It has to go through a donor eligibility determination, and then this has this inclusion criteria. The sperm is then quarantined. Once they're determined eligible, the sperm is then collected, and they're, it's quarantined for six months. And then after six months, the patient is retested for sexually transmitted infection. And if that screen's negative again, then the patient is given, then that sperm is available for um, anonymous use. <clears throat> so there are some special considerations about um, sperm donation. CMV status is one that if you go to any uh, sperm donation website, which you could go to right now, um, in fact, Let's do that. And again, I have no financial connections to this company. This is one of the largest cryobanks. So you can go to donor search and you can, you can select height, eye color, hair color. And then you'll see down here, it says CMV status. Many, many donors are CMV positive. Um, so what we ask is that you as the um, recipient so we ask the patient, hey, you know, let's check a CMV status. And if you're CMV negative, we do recommend that you select a CMV negative donor. Now, it is purely theoretical that a CMV positive donor will um, zero convert a CMV negative recipient. But still, we recommend a CMV negative recipient purchase and use CMV negative sperm when performing IUI. If you want to talk to me more about that in more detail, I'm happy to discuss, but it is based purely on a theoretical risk. Okay. Just to give you one more, let me make another comment about that. In, for example, the likelihood of a blood donor, uh, zero, uh, let me put it this way. The likelihood that a CMV negative recipient of donated blood that is zero uh, that is uh, CMV positive, the likelihood of that CMV negative recipient zero converting based on that blood exposure is 0.9%. Actually, I'm sorry, 0.0, .0 yeah, no, 0.9%. So it's very low in blood. We're talking about washed semen. So it has never been reported that someone who is CMV negative has um, zero converted to CMV positive. And why does that matter? Because if you're a recipient and zero convert and become CMV positive with a primary infection in pregnancy, there is a risk that that CMV virus is going to infect the fetus and result in congenital blindness or deafness. The likelihood of that happening, again, is very low and it approaches zero. Um, in my estimation, it is zero. But still, we have this conversation with patients and educate them on why this is actually relevant. And it's just easier to pick. We tell people, look, pick a CMV negative donor. If you cannot find one that you like, then let's talk. But that's the reason why it's there is because of this his, because of this tissue donation history of picking against discordance. Again, if you have this complicated topic, so if you have questions or comments about it, please let me know. Blood type, this is a little more obvious. If you're an RH negative recipient, you probably want to pick a donor that's RH negative. Um, to reduce the risk of alloimmunization in pregnancy. The number of vials that you should purchase is predicated on how many IUIs are you going to attempt. So when you do sperm donation, you're usually doing intrauterine insemination, which is the act of putting the sperm directly into the uterus. Not to be confused with intracervical uh, insemination, which is where you just put the sperm right in the cervix. So intrauterine insemination, you can see the images here. We're basically taking concentrated sperm and placing it in the syringe, and then that syringe goes into the uterus and we deposit the sperm into the uterus. Intracervical sperm or intravaginal uh, insemination, which can be done with home kits, 
is where you're just basically depositing sperm down here, maybe right into the mouth of the cervix or right in the vagina. And your chances of success with that are much lower, but it's a little more convenient. And some of the banks will sell kits that you can use um, for home inseminations. So again, you can look and see, you know, how descriptive these um, donors can be. You get a lot of physical characteristics, you get areas of study, um, ethnic origin, ancestry, lookalikes, uh, you know, like, this is kind of crazy. Like, do I want the guy that looks like Aaron Paul? Um, <laughs> uh, you can see, anyway, you get the point. So moving on. So which type of vial to purchase? Typically, we recommend you purchase three to four vials. Each vial is good for one IUI, which is three to four IUIs. And you usually get IUI ready sperm. Okay, so this has already been washed and it should be concentrated to about 10 million modal sperm per uh, mil. So that's the total modal sperm count per mil. If you're using it for IVF, you would do ART ready sperm or you could use IUI or even unwashed sperm as well. Okay, so the, the scenario in which you're going to use it is going to kind of dictate what vial you're going to purchase. And again, talk to your physician about that. Again, how many vials also depends on what your treatment strategy is. If you're a, you know, if you're a person who's using, who has no infertility and the reason you're using donor sperm is because your husband makes no sperm or you're a same-sex female couple who has never attempted pregnancy in any prior relationship um, before, then it would not be unreasonable to do three to four cycles of insemination uh, before trying something different. Um the which type of vial like we talked about are you doing IUI are you doing ICI are you doing IVF most clinics will recommend doing I recommend doing IUI and if that doesn't work after some period of time we move on to IVF ICI has a lower chance of success so we typically don't recommend that at least I mean we don't do that we'll do IUI in the office you can certainly do it at home um, but just know that your chances of success might be less Shipping and storage, uh, most clinic, most fertility clinics have a lab that allows storage of your sample while you're in treatment. So sometimes, you know, if you pay one shipping fee for three vials, that's less expensive than if you ship one vial at a time. Um, let's talk about this known donor versus anonymous donor. So known donation is basically, hey, I know somebody, I am not sexually active with that person though, and I want them to be the sperm donor. So that's cool. We can do that. So they basically have to, that donor would come into the clinic and would undergo the FDA eligibility determination that we described. We would make sure there's obviously sperm in his ejaculate before we subjected anybody to anything. So first thing would be a semen analysis. Then you would do the FDA determination. And then you would recommend a quarantine for six months before using that sperm. Now, some patients don't want to do that. That is the standard recommendation. That is not a rule by law, but that is a standard, community standard recommendation is that you quarantine the sperm for six months before using it. Um, that is to protect the recipient. If the patient is 38 years old or 40 years old or just doesn't want to wait, waiting six months is probably not ideal. So in that case, you really have to ask the patient, you know, how committed are they to that known person? Is it some, you know, can they find another donor that's anonymous because those people have already undergone the six month quarantine process and that those anonymous donors are readily available. The other thing with the known donor is anybody who's using third party needs to undergo reproductive counseling. So both the donor and the recipient speak to a reproductive counselor to just review issues related to using a third party. Hey, how are you going to handle how, how, you know, how might we handle talking about the child after they're born about this source of the um, gamete? Um, are there any legal issues that we should think about that we aren't thinking about? Are we good? Do you think we can handle this? Is the donor a good candidate for actually donating? Are there issues related to the donor that might put the donor and or the recipient at some sort of risk? Um, so that's where the reproductive counselor comes into play. Now, I talked a little bit about legal risks. So with a known donor, there are some legal risks that it, I do advise that both parties um, at least consult with an attorney regarding parentage in the state because parentage in each state is handled and defined differently. 
and there might be some, you know, the, the donor needs to know their legal rights as do the recipients um, so that everything is clear regarding parentage. So if there's a kerfuffle of sorts between the two parties and someone is claiming parentage, I'm the, I'm the known sperm donor, um, that's my child, I want full, you know, that is not your child, I want to do X, Y, Z, then, you know, there's some legal framework or there has been some discussion in place before such a thing could happen. So there's a lot of case law about known donors and anonymous donors for that matter um, that I think if you want to read more, let me know and I can give you some resources. Anonymous donor, those issues are largely um, out of the picture because these are anonymous donors that have essentially signed for, to make it simple, signed away um, their ability to be to, to signed away their um, ability to parent to be de- considered the parent. Now I know there's lots of stories of people going back and finding out who the parent was, it's, uh, who the uh, sperm source is, etc. Um, again, there's a lot of case law that if you're interested, in, I would recommend you reading. But as a general rule, the threshold for using a known donor is a little bit requires a little more hoops for the recipient to jump through. Um, just to protect both the donor and the recipient, whereas the anonymous donor is a little bit easier, um, just to put it prank practically. I've done both, and we, you know, whatever the patient feels most comfortable with, as long as they're informed, is what we move forward with. So the success rates with sperm donation are about 15%. So that might not sound like it's very good, but if you think about it, the maximum efficiency of human reproduction is at best 20%. So sperm donation probably gets you to about 15 to 20%. And again, that hinges on the age of the female recipient. That hinges on, does she have any other underlying infertility per se? Maybe she has ovulation dysfunction and irregular periods. Uh, maybe she has some tubal factor. But you know, this is in a natural cycle using no medication. Obviously, this goes up if you give the patient Clomid and super ovulate them. Um, And what approach you take just varies from patient to patient.